We uh, tackled uh, intelligence a couple of months ago. So now we're going to tackle personality. And I got, I, I, I got some things I want to say about that. Um, not that I know everything, um, but this is within my wheelhouse. Um, I am on a mission to make psychology biblical again. Um, yes, and I will trademark that. Um, so let's go ahead and pray. And then, uh, and then we'll go through this discourse here. Lord, thank you that when it comes to the substance and nature of human beings, we know exactly what you teach and exactly your, uh, your instruction. And I pray, God, that this would be beneficial and that this would give us time to think um, mull over and uh, really process this to understand the nature and substance of who we are and how that impacts how we think of ourselves and the choices we make. Uh, thank you, Lord, so much for this opportunity, for it's in your son's name. Amen. Okay, let's get it started. This is the agenda for this morning. I will attempt to try to do four things. One, I will attempt to uh, explore the origin of the English word personality. I think it is important that when we're talking about topical discussions like this, that we define terms okay, um, and define them clearly so that when we go to the scriptures, we're able to see if it's there or not in terms of its substance and use. Then we're going to look at a small brief history of human personality. This I mean, I could spend about four Sundays talking about this, um, but instead we're just going to cover the main uh, the main people that have kind of influenced personality as we know it today. Then we're going to examine the scriptures and you'll be surprised at where we're going. So that'll be kind of fun. And then I want to explore some questions. If indeed human personality is important and what are the implications of that? Why is this important? Why does it matter? Right. This is kind of one of these worldview Sundays, right? Where, um, you know, um, does the Bible discuss this or not? Right. And how are we to understand that? So let's go ahead and get started. Defining the word personality. Let's talk about this word here. What does this word mean? Well, it's if you break it down, um, and it's word again. I, I like I like etymology, so I'm I'm a, I'm a word nerd. I'm sorry, um, sue me. Um, uh, the word person, the English word person, comes from a Latin word person, meaning an individual or a human being. Right? That it's pretty much pretty clear, right, from the word itself. When we when we look at this phrase, this case ending, I T Y. OK, this case ending right here. Every time a word ends in that in that ending, when it when it comes with a noun like person, it refers to the nature or quality of a particular thing. Right. So putting them together, smashing them, presto, blammo, personality can be understood to be the nature and quality of human beings. Right. Duh. Um, that's self-explanatory. However, what if we were to rephrase it as a question? Okay. In other words, what makes a person a person? Okay. Now, this is kind of, this is, of course, this could be understood as the nature and quality of human beings, of course. But if we ask it like this, what makes a person a person? You'll find that you'll, there's a lot of individuals that have a lot of things to say about this. Let's go to my favorite place. Now, now, usually I would go to commentaries here, but we're not going to go to commentaries as they're normally understood. We're going to go to commentaries from other sources, not biblical ones, such as the American Psychological Association. How would they describe personality? Personality, according to them, refers to individual differences in characteristic patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving. The study of personality focuses on two broad areas, according to the APA, understanding individual differences in particular personality characteristics. This person 
is expressive, this person is analytical, this person is that. Such as sociability and irritability. That's funny, right? You, can, you, may, you have a personality, an irritable, you're in, you have an irritable personality. Try, try getting away with that with your spouse. The other understanding is how the various parts of a person come together as the whole uh, of the origin of the English word personality. All right? That's the APA's definition or explanation, shall I say. Encyclopedia Britannica, everyone's favorite encyclopedia for studying and writing papers, says this, personality... Um, a characteristic way of thinking, feeling, and behaving. Personality embraces moods, attitudes, and opinions and is most clearly expressed in interactions with other people. It includes behavioral characteristics, both inherent, that is, you're born with them, and acquired, that is, that you learn them, <clears throat> that distinguishes one person from another and that can be observed in people's relations to the environment to the, and, and, and to the social group, okay? So it is the behavioral characteristics, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, that makes people different from other people, right? Got it. How about this one? New World Encyclopedia. Again, everyone's favorite encyclopedia to quote in book, books and things like that. It says, a person's characteristic behavior pattern Many people think personality is made up of observable traits, such as shyness, friendliness, and intuitive. However, such traits are only the outward expressions of various inner conditions, processes such as intelligence, attitudes, interests, and motives. So, so if you are friendly, that is one aspect, according to the New World Encyclopedia of your personality. However, if you are highly intelligent or not, that is, a no, that is an inner condition of, uh, of your personality. Now, you all know how I feel about intelligence. If you don't, please go back and, 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 uh, and watch that. Um, I think we have that all wrong, but uh, never mind. That's another story for another time. Here is a uh, particular quote. This is the title of this particular uh, article here. It's called Historical Perspectives on Personality, the past, and per, uh, the past and Current Concept. The search is not yet over. This is what they say here. What makes us what we are? What makes a person a person, right? It is our body or the psyche or mind or both. Definitely the answer is both. How do they know that? Because read the next sentence. While there is generally no agreed upon definition of personality, most theories focus on motivation and psychological interactions with one's environment. Says who exactly? Me. Is this a problem? If we have no generally agreed upon explanation, we find this a lot, especially within periods of academia. That, that, that there's no, it's the same thing with intelligence. Remember that one phrase? Well, looked at in one way, we all know what it is. Looked at in another way, no one does. What? So how do you, how do you measure for something that you can't define? How do you do that? Keep this in mind, because we'll come back to this. Let's look at the influencers. The influencers of personality theory. I know, again, this, this, this is, I'm getting to the scriptures. We'll, we'll talk about that, okay? I just got to lay this out. Y'all know how I, you know how I do, okay? First of all, everyone's favorite whipping boy, Sigmund Freud. As a matter of fact, Sigmund Freud was the one that actually postulated about personality as it's, ma, as, 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 as it's popularly taught, and people kind of built on that, okay? He, or uh, his personality theory originated from what he referred to as the id, ego, and superego. That's what makes up the personality, according to Freud, that the id was kind of like the child. Gimme, 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 right? And the ego was like the parent. 
no, you can't have this, right? It's going to make you sick. So instead, you should do this. The id's only purpose is for pleasure. That's it, according to Freud. The ego is what keeps the id in check. And the superego is kind of like, I guess you could say the constitution, kind of like the moral code of a person, right? That's what the ego draws from to control the id, right? He mentioned that this, this is kind of the personality of an individual, as well as the uh, conscious and unconscious and all that stuff. We won't talk about that. Okay. Eric Erickson, who was kind of who was taught by Sigmund Freud, developed uh, 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 what he would call his personality development theory, and that throughout the human lifespan, humanity would go through certain periods of crisis. By the way, you have you ever heard the term midlife crisis? That comes from this man. Okay. And that you have to conquer certain crises. And if you do, you develop in your personality. If you do not, you either remain stagnant in your personality. Okay? Then we have Carl Jung. Carl Jung's very fascinating. Okay, fascinating guy. As a matter of fact, a lot of the personality stuff that we get now is from him. For instance, have you ever heard of the term introvert? That comes from him. Extrovert, that comes from him. Okay? The term persona, when a person wears a mask, you know, they, 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 they're putting on a front or something like that in front of somebody, that also comes from him. Okay? He's made up about 25 to 30 percent of the vernacular we use to, to talk about personality. Type A, him. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. He believed that ancestral images and memories have been impressed upon a person's conscious. He believed in what was known as the collective conscious, that there are images and things that we recognize, that no one has to teach us what these images are. We know them because they have been genetically passed down throughout the ages, right? Millions of years, according to Carl Jung, okay? And these images and memories are what he would refer to as archetypes. And I know that you, some of you guys have heard this. Okay? That's where we get, we get that from him too. I don't want to spend too much time on him. I could talk about him all day because um, he's interesting. Then we have Abraham Maslow. Abraham Maslow forming his hierarchy of needs. We're, we will get to him in another, in another uh, teaching, I promise you. Okay? Because um, I I kind of took his and kind of did some stuff. Too. But anyway, never mind. Personality is formed and developed when he said that needs were met. And these hierarchy of needs, basically, if one doesn't have these hierarchy, like, for instance, food, clothing, shelter, water, they can't move up the pyramid, so to speak. Right. Because that's the thing that they need to uh, to develop in their personality. The top of the pyramid he referred to as self-actualization. When one realizes their true purpose and realizes what they need to strive for, they self-actualize. They become more of their authentic self. Yeah, we get that from him too, as well as existentialism. So these are kind of the four influencers mainly. There are other ones, but these are kind of the ones that are brought up and everyone kind of knows, um, especially within my circle. Now, a noteworthy question, what do all these people have in common? And I actually want you to answer this. All right. So don't just sit there and wait for me. I want you to answer the question. What do all of these people have in common? Atheists. Atheist. Yeah, you guys are, man, you guys are, you guys are so smart. I love all of you guys. You guys are so amazing. All of them form the basis of the quality of a person from a God is not perspective. All of them. So if that's the case, then that means they could be right, but maybe they're not because the perspective of personality that they're looking at is a view that's antithetical to ours. This is a, this is a problem. Okay, now enough of this. Let's go to the scriptures. Can you please turn with me to Genesis?
Genesis chapter 1, actually. Does the scriptures teach personality? Now, remember how we talked about personality distinguishes us from each other, right? Based upon our, our attitudes, our motives, our behaviors, things like that, right? And stuff like that. Let's go ahead and read Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, and then we'll make some, we'll make some, uh, some observations here. This is on day six of God, first of all, speaking things into existence here, uh, arranging, ordering everything, right? And then we see in verse 26, God intending to make humanity. It says this, verse 26, then God said, let us make mankind or humanity in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and the livestock and all the earth. And over every crawling thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky. And over every living thing that moves on the earth. Very self-explanatory, right? Uh, God uh, creating humanity, male and female, and giving them uh, things to do, responsibilities, tasks, things of this nature, the, the intentionality of him creating men. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of things here. Um, the Hebrew word here for image and likeness, I think this is important. The word for image is the word salem, okay? This Hebrew word occurs 17 times in the Hebrew scriptures, okay? And this word is used often... Um, now, again, just kind of underscoring with, with Hebrew, again, the context, Hebrew is very fluid. So the context determines how we're going to see this word and how this word is meant to be understood. Okay. So this word is, is used to speak of human beings. Okay. Genesis 5, 3 and 9, 6, when uh, uh, Noah, uh, when God is talking to Noah and saying that, a, a person may not take another person's life. Why? Because they're made in the image of God, Salem. Okay? They cannot do that. They take their life unjustly. Okay? And in, another interesting place where this is found, this word, Salem, it occurs mostly, okay? So it is used of human beings being made in God's image, but, uh, but it is also used when Israel makes idols. Matter of fact, it's more frequently used there. So we've got Numbers uh, 33, 52, 2 Kings 11, 2 Chronicles 23, where they make idols fashioned in the likeness or in the image, I'm sorry, of something else, right? So that's important here to realize that uh, 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 God has made us in his image. Salem, we'll talk about that in a minute. The next phrase is the word likeness, demut. Demut. This Hebrew word occurs 25 times in the Hebrew scriptures. And again, it is used in various ways within the Hebrew scriptures. Again, the context tells us how this is meant to be understood. In some respects, it is translated as creatures um, when it's talking about the animals and things like that. This word underscores something, again, that is similar or resemble something else. It is not exactly like that, but it is similar to it, okay? It is not the same, but it is similar. This word here, demut, is used especially in Ezekiel. Now, why is it used there? Because Ezekiel, whenever he's describing the things that he sees, he uses this word as this thing resembles this thing. This thing is similar to this. This thing is like this. When he's seeing this, the uh, when he's in the throne room of God and is mentioning all of these things that are flying around and something like that, he's he's trying to give you a picture of what this looks like. And he uses this word often. Okay, demut. It is it is similar or resembles this. Okay. Now, what are these two words? Why are they important? And what does this have to do with the aspect of person? What makes a person a person? 
Well, let's let's run down the rabbit hole. These two words, likeness and image. I'll use Salem more than Demut because I believe that we don't have the likeness of God. We will. Um, um, and that's Genesis 9. We'll talk about that. But the image is retained. But these two words informs the reader of the source or origin of humanity is from God. That's clear. Okay. These two words, especially within verse 26, also inform the reader that humanity was created from the mind of God. We see the intent in verse 26. He says, let us make man. This is a thought expressed verbally. Okay. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Okay. We did not pre-exist. Okay. We weren't in the courts of heaven, right, waiting for a body, you know, now serving uh, Luther Smith uh, 246 with a body. That, that's, that, that's not how it goes, okay? We didn't pre-exist, okay? But God intentionally, intentionally sought to make humanity, okay? So you weren't an accident, okay? Man, mankind wasn't an accident, okay? He didn't rise from... Uh, from the swamp, he was created with intent in mind. Another thing, too, is that these two words also inform the reader that humanity, at least at the beginning, was created in the semblance of God in terms of character and conduct. Okay? Mankind is not God. Because we do not have the incommunicable attributes. That is, we don't know everything. We're not all powerful. We can't speak things into existence, right? But in terms of our character and conduct, we, there was some semblance, which is why he gave the responsibility for them to govern or have dominion over creation itself, right? That's the point. But there's more, there's more details than that that, uh, that underscore personality. Again, I'm, I'm building this case here, so just follow me. Let's turn to Genesis 2. We have the formation of male and female. Now, I, I, I believe that Genesis 2, um, how can I say this? There's a pattern in Genesis 1. <clears throat> God speaks, it happens. God says, it's so. God says, it's so. God says, it's so. But when you get to humanity, God says, and there ain't that. That's a change in the pattern, right? And this pattern is so radical. Even the, the, the description of God, of man being made in the image of God. He doesn't say this about the plant. He doesn't say this about the skies. He doesn't say this about the water. Doesn't say this about the dirt. Doesn't say this about the plant, the, the animals in the sea, animals that came from, from, you know, the beasts of the field. He doesn't say about anybody, about any other creature he makes, only male and female. This is so unique. So what? So amazing that Genesis 2 answers the question, well, how were they made then if they weren't spoken into existence? And Genesis 2 answers that question. So in Genesis 2, 7, we find the formation and the creation of man, that is Adam. Verse 7. I'll start at verse 6. But a mist used to rise from the surface of the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. We talked about this last hour with the resurrection. Paul used this um, in, in his discourse in uh, uh, Corinthians 15. The word for form is the word yasar. Okay? In this context, it means to form like a potter forms clay into something, molded the shape of humanity. This is all intentional. 
After God molds man from the dirt, forms him, he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and man becomes a living being or a living soul. This word for soul or being is the word nephesh. This is an interesting word. Okay. Again, it is used in various places. And again, the context tells us how this word is to be understood. When it comes to human beings, now it is used of, of, of animals and stuff like that too. I think it's talking about the breath and them being alive. But when it comes to the, uh, the, the, the way it's used of human beings, it's very fascinating. This is an interesting Hebrew word. When discussing the nature of human beings, depending on the focus or the point of the passage, it could refer to the immaterial aspect of a human being and its functions. We see this, as a matter of fact, in Ecclesiastes 6, just preparing for you know, our discourse into Ecclesiastes at 9, right? Just to let you guys know, for those of you guys who aren't coming, Come and hear this. Okay. Chapter 6, verse 9. I'll start at verse 7. A man's labor is for his mouth, and yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage does the wise man have over the fool? What advantage does the poor man have knowing how to walk before the living? What the eyes see is better than what the soul desires. I find this to be very fascinating because here Solomon is making a contrast with two aspects of man. The physical, what their eyes see, and what the soul desires. That means your soul desires. It has wants. This too is futility and a striving after the wind. This word here for um, 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 uh, the soul is nephesh. Okay. So it could refer to the immaterial aspect of a human being and its functions. Or, or shall we say and, it could also refer to the whole individual or person. Turn with me to Genesis 46. Verse 18. By the way, <clears throat> um, Leviticus uses this word a lot. Genesis 46, verse 18. I'll start at verse 17. Then the sons of Asher, Imna, Ishva, and Ishvi, and Beriah, and their sister Sarah, and the sons of Beriah, Haber, and Malachel. These are the sons of Zilpah, who Laban gave to his daughter Leah, and she bore to Jacob 16 persons. Is that, is that in your translation? That word is nephesh. 16 souls. You could translate it as that. But 16 persons. I mean, they weren't there weren't 16 souls like flying around like this. You know what I'm saying? That's not what it means here. They they identify 16 persons or people. That word is nephesh too. So do you have a soul or are you a soul? Yeah. It's kind of fun. But wait, there's more. The building and animation of female. And going back to Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 to 22. It's kind of interesting here just to kind of look at the activity, especially within day six, recorded in Genesis chapter 2. We find that God, he, he speaks his intention to create female. He goes uh, in verse 18 of chapter two, he says, it is not good 
that man should be to be alone, I will make a helper corresponding to or suitable for him. Right. So he speaks and he intends to make, you know, a, 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 a being corresponding to Adam. But what, what's fascinating is, is he doesn't put him to sleep right away. Right. Instead, he has them name all these animals. Now, when I first read this, I kind of scratched my head. I said, now, if I was God, I would just intend to do it, knock him to sleep, you know, create a female, bring them to the male, and then they have them create, and then have them name the animals, right? That seems to make more sense. But he puts them to sleep first, or no, he, he has them name the animals first, then puts them to sleep. What is going on here? I think the reason why he did this was instructive for Adam to show him that he's not like these creatures. He is to, this is one of the first things to do that you show that you have dominion over the creatures, right? You give them names. That's what you do, right? And so that's what he's doing. Then he puts them to sleep. As a matter of fact, we will start at verse 20. The man gave names to all the cattle and to all the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a helper corresponding to him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon a man and he slept. And he took out one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God fashioned, that term is bana, fashioned. This is different than formed. It's not yasar. He formed man out of the dust of the ground. But for the woman, he built her. Like a person constructing or erecting a building or structure. He didn't form woman. He built her. That's pretty amazing. From the rib of Adam. Notice he didn't take a rib from the rhinoceros. Okay. He didn't take a rib from the giraffe. He didn't take a rib uh, uh, from uh, the orangutan. Right. He took a rib from Adam. All of this activity from God regarding humanity was important for several reasons. He took a rib from Adam, built Eve, built the woman, and presented the woman to Adam. And Adam, recognizing that she was like him in substance and form, says this, this is now bone of my bones, literally. Flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of her, taken from man. This is huge. All this activity from God regarding humanity was important for several reasons, okay? One, it established that human beings were distinctive from animals. This is, this is important because there's a lot of people that believe that we're just a higher level animal, even some Christians. But that's not true. It's not what the text says. Okay, The last thing that was presented to Adam to complete day six was Eve. There was no presentation of anything else. It's very important. It established that human beings were distinctive from vegetation. Trees are not our ancestors, folks. You can't marry the ocean. Human beings were distinctive from vegetation. And it also established that human beings are capable of thought and reasoning. They were told to bear, to bear fruit and multiply and fill the earth. They were told to caretake for the animals. They were told to, to have relationships and things like that. All of this implies thought and reasoning, these, these abilities. So what is the point here? What is the point of personality? Based upon these two texts, just Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, looking at a couple of phrases, looking at a couple of Hebrew words, things like that, where are you going with this? Here's the punchline. This is what I believe personality to be from a biblical perspective. The alternative perspectives about personality.
focus on external behaviors, right? If you're expressive, if you're analytical, if you're um, uh, irritable, if you're social or antisocial, all of these are on external behaviors, habits, or internal responses, motives, which like we can know those anyway, attitudes. However, it would seem from the biblical perspective that the form and substance of human beings make up personality. The fact that we are human beings is the definition of personality, not the external behaviors or attitudes. In addition, this would bring into this would bring up the the purpose of personality assessments, does it not? Because don't personality assessments aren't they created with the sole purpose of finding out who you are as a person? Well, if personality assessments don't measure personality, what are they measuring? Personality assessments and theories seek to describe what makes a person unique from another. I am unique from David Meadows because he's more intelligent than I am. Or I'm more unique than Stephen because I'm more expressive than he is. That's how personality works, does it not? Oh, I'm not as analytical as you are. So, you know, I can understand why you do that. But from a biblical perspective, Per, if, if personality, if the, if, if the main point of personality is the form and structure and substance of a human being, then personality from a biblical perspective does not distinguish us from each other, but it distinguishes us from the rest of creation. That is what makes up a person. We are not animals nor are we vegetation. How do I know that? Because I'm a person with thoughts, attitudes, things like that. So now that I've laid that out, I'm, I'm trying to anticipate your questions. There's five of them here. I know there's more than five in this room. How, why do we have different interests, hobbies, etc. then? Why do we respond differently to certain situations of personality from how we've known it? How, how do you explain that? Why do some people think differently from their family of origin then, right? If their personality is different from their, let's say, their mom or their dad or whatever, right? How can you have five children and each of them kind of, kind of do different things? How's that? How do you explain that? What, a, what is a person assessing when they take a personality assessment? What is that? What are they studying? And what is personality assessment measuring if not personality? We will attempt to answer these questions. Let's look at, let's go back and look at Genesis 126 to 28 again. Remember, human beings possess the, the ability to think and reason. This, isn't, this comes from the fact that we are made in the Imago Dei, the image of God. The source of reasoning and thinking comes from God. He is given that as an attribute for us because we are made in his image. Okay? We are also capable of producing other human beings through the reproductive system. This is very, this is very common. This is found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. We are also capable of labor and activity. Okay? Now, think about these things. Uh, think about the first two points just for a minute. We have the ability to think and reason. H have you ever had a deep discussion with your dog? 
Well, I'm sure that you've, you've talked about deep issues with your dog. And then what does your dog do? Just licks you, right? Nothing, you know, which is cute, right? Have you ever had a, a philosophical discourse with your goldfish? No, you've never had that, right? You're not asking your goldfish, uh, what do you, you know, I was reading Plato's Republic. And uh, what do you think about that? All you're going to see is just bubbles floating up to the top, right? Only human beings do this. Only human beings think about things that we do and the processes and stuff like that. You don't go to your tree and ask your tree what the purpose of life is. They're just going to sway in the wind with the branches. That's all they're going to do. Okay? We think like this. And that makes us distinctive from the rest of creation. Yes, um, we have nests in our all over our house because our birds like our house for some reason. And, and of course, they, you know, birds build nests and they're nice and they're structured and they're nice and warm, but they don't build towers like we do. They don't pull out the measuring rod. Okay, I think I need a, a nest about four, maybe four inches, you know. Um, hey, honey, you want to come and take a look at this? No, we don't do that. Or the birds don't do that. We do this. Okay. Human beings are, are capable of producing human beings. We don't produce anything else. Okay. We will never in our life produce uh, a, a, a vulture. Okay. Human beings are capable of labor. By the way, your birds... Don't uh, come and knock on your door. Amazon, I got a package for you. That'll never happen. I don't care what Elon Musk does. Okay? <laughs> It'll never happen. Okay? People do that. They knock on your door and leave things. We produce things that people need. Okay? You'll never see an orangutan in a, in a business suit talking about, you know what? I think I'm going to do a startup company. That'll never happen. We're capable of that, of serving individuals. Okay? That, again, that makes us distinctive. Male and female interaction would be the standard for various relationships. Contrary to popular belief, we ought not to look to the animal kingdom as to how we ought to relate as human beings. Because we're not them. We ought to look to God's word and each other to understand that. This brings us to the aspect of unity and diversity in the activities and choices of humanity. How do we have different individuals that do different things and different activities with people? Well, this is very simple. When you look at the scriptures, it is clear. Let's go through a couple of examples. First of all, the Bible does not inform each human being on the specifics of what type of labor. Uh, you can't turn to the Bible, Stephen, and go, Stephen, be a doctor. First Fleshalonians, too. You won't find it. Okay? It's not there. However, the scripture does inform a believer of the paradigm, the outlook of how to view labor. As a doctor, work is unto the Lord serve your patients. That's so much more. You see the difference? That means we can have all types of vocations from garbage collector to school teacher to, to uh, nurse to doctor to lawyer. Well, again, I'm, I don't know about that, but the, the, uh, um, um, politic. No, I can't use that either. Um, uh, we can have all types of vocations. All types of activities, mother, father, student, all of these. That's, God makes concessions for those. Example number two, the Bible does not instruct a person on what type of physical features. Now, when I was, uh, when I was a, uh, a, a, a bachelor, um, I didn't turn to uh, uh, first my opinions and go, uh, thus says the word of the Lord. You should look for a Hispanic woman who has black hair and is about 5'5", five, five, 
um, um, and and uh, and is older than you. Doggone it, that fits Tanya's description. It doesn't say that. The Bible does not instruct a person on what physical features a person should consider when they marry. But the Bible does give human beings the proper perspective as how to conduct oneself. Hey, when you have a wife, love your wife. If you have a husband, respect your husband. Doesn't matter what they look like. They could look like the elephant man. It doesn't matter. You love them. The Bible does not inform a believer how they ought to uh, on who they ought to establish friends with. Hey, make sure you go to you open up your Bible. Hey, make sure you go down the street and talk to your neighbor five doors down. It doesn't say that. However, the scripture does inform a believer on the qualities that they ought to look for when establishing friendships. You want a person who is dedicated, a person who uh, understands uh, uh, your needs, a person who you who you can serve as well, a person who doesn't who is who doesn't steal from you, who doesn't lie, a person who's who doesn't do reckless things. The Bible does not give a specific method or technique for mom and dads to instruct their children. We sometimes wish it did. However, the scripture does instruct parents that ought to train their children in God's word. That's clear. There are certain principles we can use to guide and instruct our children and things like that. But there is not, when you have a rowdy, rowdy, bout it, bout it child, do this, right? If you have a wonderful, gracious, nice nature child, do this. Right. It gives us the perspective that we have the responsibility to train our children in God's word. And by the way, if we are doing that, then this also gives variation in how we train and, and raise our kids. Some kids need, you know, that stern talking to some of them go, well, just let them fail. See what happens. Right. It's very important. Example number five, humanity thinks about personal experiences, by the way. Uh, animals don't do that, contrary to popular belief, okay? They don't do that. And assigns value to these experiences from one's philosophy. However, God's word gives humanity wisdom as to how to observe personal experiences from a biblical framework, okay? In short, God does not give these instructions to animals, he does not give these instructions to plants. He doesn't give them to the heavenly bodies. He gives them to us. And since we are a soul, God anticipates these differences in the choices, in the activity of humanity. Why? Because we have our own thoughts, our own reasoning. We, we are not, we're not just, con, you know, connected mentally, uh, you know, to our parents. We, we have these because these, these are things that God has given to us because we're made in his image. If you remember from our Then How Shall We Live conference, the macro themes, God's more concerned about those. So answering these three questions, why do, why do we have different interests, hobbies, et cetera? Why do we respond differently to certain situations and things like that? Why do some people act differently from their family of origin, right? Well, these are deep dive questions. That's what I call them. They're not difficult questions. They're just deep dive ones. It depends on many factors. One's worldview. That's why worldview is important because it ought to govern your decisions and how you view life. One's personal interests. There are some in here that like, there are some in here, I, I like Rocky Road ice cream. There are some that don't. You all are wrong, okay? <laughs> but that's a personal interest of mine. Effort, time, attention, influences that we take in, all of these things come from the ability to think and to reason and to process, which comes from our spirit, 
our soul. That's the activity, the function of who we are and materially. Okay? Depending on the answers to these, they will give us the answers to these, each and every individual part. Okay? That's why I like philosophy, some like mathematics. It doesn't make us distinct, it doesn't distinguish us from each other. It shows that we are both made in the image of God because we have these interests that we're pursuing. It underscores personhood. So, breaking it down a little bit more. Personality, secular humanism versus the biblical perspective. Personality, according to this perspective, is built on a macro evolutionary foundation. It is, because again, all the people who made these theories built it on this framework that God is not. What is left? The person, biological, you know, neurotransmitters, things like that. Okay? But personality is built on the image of God from a biblical perspective. We start there, right? We cannot get around that. Genesis 1, Genesis 9, the whole lot. And pers personality from a secular humanistic perspective is built on the assumption that humankind is a more evolved animal and is only material. That's all we are. Cells, neurotransmitters, dendrites. What's a dendrite? Don't worry about it. it is, we're only material. We're nothing else. But personality from the biblical perspective is built on the reality that humanity has and is a soul, material and immaterial. We are not just body parts or neurotransmitters. We're more than that. From a secular humanistic perspective, personality is established by external actions or motivations. I'm an expressive. I'm an introvert, I'm an extrovert, I'm type A, I'm type B, I'm type O, I'm type AB. I'm just playing. In the Enneagram, I'm a six. We haven't gotten to that yet. That's another one on the docket too. I got, I got words for that too. Be sure you're here for that. Personality emphasizes the substance and the form, not the motivations or the actions. In personality, in secular humanism, diversity in personality is what makes us human beings, right? The fact that we do different things together. But in the biblical perspective, the personality is, is, that, we are, is that we have a soul, that we are a soul. That's what makes us human beings. And that's what distinguishes us from everything. I love the fact that we have thousands of things represented here, or not thousands, many things represented here. But even more so, I love the fact that all of us have a soul and that we are one. That's what makes us human, unique. Personality distinguishes us from one another. Personality distinguishes us from plants and animals. I think that is a proper way to read that. And the material is primarily responsible for the diversity of hobbies and the activities of humanity. What gives me the dopamine shot is what I will pursue. Right? But in the biblical perspective, the immaterial and the functions of the immaterial is what... Uh, is what uh, is responsible for the diversity of hobbies and activities of humanity. Lastly, everyone has different personalities according to secular humanists, whereas the biblical perspective, everyone has the same personality because we are all made from the same form and substance. This is what makes a person a person. We are material and immaterial. So, we haven't gotten to these two questions. What is a person assessing then when they take a personality assessment? And what is a personality assessment measuring, if not personality? Would you like to know that? I think that would be important to do that. Well, 
We're out of time. The next time we talk about this, I will do part two of this. And I'm sure that Will, uh, after he listens to it, he'll be like, well, you got to do it next week. All right. Let's go ahead and pray. And then we will uh, close out our session for fellowship. Lord, you, you truly are amazing. You're an amazing, amazing God. And uh, you have made us very, very complex. And, uh, and uh, we thank you so much, Lord, that uh, how we're made underscores who we are in substance and form. I pray, Lord, that we would think about this, um, that we would ponder this and, uh, and, and think about the implications of this. Um, that uh, what really makes us persons is how we're made. And, and that's cool. Thank you, Lord, so much for this time and for this day. I pray, God, that you would continue, Lord, um, to instruct us by your word, and may our minds continually be transformed by it. We love you so much, for it's in your son's name. Amen.